Why are you running for Lucas County Sheriff? Well, when I first got into law enforcement, I swore to protect and serve. And believe it or not, I know how silly that may sound to some people, but um, helping people truly is something that I that that I I long to do. And I think that by running for sheriff, um, I can do that on a bigger scale than I've been able to do my 28 years prior to this. What previous law enforcement experience do you believe will come in handy if you're elected to the sheriff position? In my 28 years, I've had a lot of different law enforcement experience. Um, I think probably the one, if I had to pinpoint one of them, I would think it would be uh, the things that I have been able to do in our community as far as community engagement and community involvement. Um, I think I've been successful at communicating with, with people, sharing information with people, and, and understanding where people are coming from. And I think that uh, communication is the key to being a successful sheriff. If you're elected, what changes will you make to the sheriff's office? Well, there's not, in the Lucas County Sheriff's Office, I don't know that there's a lot of things that have to be severely changed right now, but there are some things that we really need to continue to push forward on. One of those is recruitment. Um, nowadays, it's becoming harder and harder to find people who are interested to go into law enforcement. And uh, so unfortunately, we are very short uh, at, in, in, in our, our organization. We are um, actively searching for, looking for um, new employees. And so I think recruitment is one of the things that we have to really push hard on to make sure that we can find people to fill those vacant positions, quality people who are interested in a career. Uh, that in turn makes it safer for not just our citizens, but it also makes it safer for all those employees who sometimes are forced to work longer hours than need be. But, and the other thing that I'm, 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 I'm really passionate about is training. Uh, I would like to see us be able to do a lot more update training than, than, than what we do now. I think update training should be a regular part of law enforcement, just as it is for say, uh, I recently, uh, not too long ago, was talking with a pharmacist who explained to me how much changes in his career field on a regular basis and how he has to make sure that he's always updated on all those changes. Law enforcement's no different. Things change every single day and we need to make sure that we're allowing our officers to receive those update update trainings. If any, what policing protocols do you believe need to change? Well, I think need to change or continue to change, I think would be um, the way that I would probably want to, if I were able to reword your question without offending you, um, continue to change and that we need to continue to give our, our officers the uh, tools that they need to do their job properly. Um, one of the thing that, things that many of our officers have been going through in, previ in, in previous years is something called CIT training. And in CIT training, officers are learning how to recognize when they arrive at a scene, recognize people who might have disabilities, recognize people who might have specific challenges that might uh, need a certain type of, 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 of resource. And so for us to be able to continue to learn to identify different situations or that people may be in so that we can be uh, the voice that provides that resource to those people that they need. Not every situation is an arrestable situation. Uh, we have to understand, and most officers, when you go, I remember when I went through the academy many years ago, they said, you know, you're not just a police officer. This isn't about pulling people over. You, you are a counselor. You are so many other things. Um, and, and one of the things that you have to be is a resource. You have to be a resource to connect people to things in the community that they may need. And, and I think that that's one of the things that has to be continue to, to, to push in that direction. As of recent, there has been increased discussion surrounding police reform. On day one, will you be ready to be active in those discussions? Well, I think that when I talk about training, when I talk about update training, when I talk about giving officers the tools that they need to, to provide people the resources that they need, uh, I mean, I think those are the steps that are right now actively uh, being worked on that I need to continue to push forward. In my mind, that's what reform is. Reform is allowing the officers the opportunity to get that training, update training that they need, giving them the training to make, a, make to be able to identify situations that are not necessarily arrestable situations and giving them all the resources that they need to contact to, to be able to get that information to people. To me, that's truly what um, reform is. It's, it's, it's simply bettering um, those who are doing the job now. Um, so that's, that's 
to me to push that forward is something that it, it is very important to me. Do you believe there need to be changes surrounding bias? I think that that goes back to uh, my, my training uh, that we need to continue to do, um, but not just training, but um, one of the things that I always, I, I point out to people on a regular basis is that I've been in law enforcement for 28 years. And when I was offered my first position, um, I had a psychological evaluation. And during that psychological evaluation, they make a determination on whether or not they feel that you will be uh, somebody who could, who could continue to work, to, to go into law enforcement. And so obviously after that psychological evaluation, um, I was allowed to, to go into law enforcement. In those 28 years, I've not had another psychological evaluation. Things change in people's lives, especially law enforcement officers. They see things, they deal with things that changes the way they sometimes might feel about things. And so I think that what really we need to do is we need to be offering opportunities and maybe even at some point, maybe even mandating that officers um, spend time talking about some of the things that have happened in their career, in their lives, to make sure that, you know, there's still that person that, you know, should be, should be doing the job that they're doing. I mean, if you think about it, uh, if you don't see your doctor for a year or so, your doctor's probably going to call you, right? If you're fortunate enough to have a primary care physician and you don't go see that primary care physician, someone's going to call you and say, hey, uh, how about coming in for a checkup, right? Um, shouldn't that be the, the, the mindset that we have uh, when it comes to careers that uh, deal with the types of things that law enforcement deal with? And we have to make that seem as though it's not a punishment, though. We have to make sure that, we, that, that, that law enforcement officers understand that this is just one more tool to help make them uh, better to help make them more effective, to help them help make them more successful. Them being successful in turn directly helps our public. You know, if, and if we're not doing those things, providing those opportunities to the law enforcement officers, then we're shortchanging our, our 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 citizens. One topic that was brought up during police reform discussions was the need for military grade gear for local law enforcement. What is your position on that? Well, military grade. First of all, you're talking to a 23 year military veteran. Um, so what I see or, 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 or think of as military grade uh, is sometimes different than what um, often other people um, see it as. But um, when you raise your hand and you swear to protect the rights of others and you swear to protect the safety of others, you have to keep one thing, one thing in mind. If you're not able to be safe yourself, you can't help others. And so, you know, when we talk about equipment, you know, safety equipment like that, if it's going to provide safety to the officers whose job is then in turn to provide safety to our citizens, then obviously it's something that can be helpful to everybody. Um, if, if, if the officer is unable uh, to, to help others because of something that's happened to them, that's a problem. So if we're talking about safety equipment that can help officers remain safe so that they can do their job of protecting others, then, then I would be in favor of that. But military grade is kind of, I'd have to be, I'd have to have more specifics to really go, go into depth about the equipment itself. Do you believe that some of the gear that law enforcement uses can be perceived as a threat to just everyday people, which law enforcement, uh, are just everyday people, but in turn, do you believe that some people may be turned off by things that may seem as a threat to them? Um, it's perception and all people's perception is different. And certainly there may be people out there who perceive it that way, which is why I go back to one of the most important things that, that we've talked about is community engagement. I have had the good fortune of spending a majority of my career in the classroom with young people. I've had the opportunity to talk to them about the dangers of drugs and violence. And, and people sometimes wanna argue with me whether drug prevention actually works. And I always argue with them that you can't do a survey that tells me how many young people didn't do drugs because of a pro program that they had. You obviously can do a survey that says, you know, there's so many people that did drugs even though they had the program, but you can't do it the other way. So you, 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 we could argue about that all day long, but there's another side of this that sometimes is forgotten about. And what, what that is, is that all these, all these years and these thousands upon thousands of students that I've had the good fortune of sharing curriculums with, we've also built a bond and we've also built a certain expectation of what a law enforcement officer is. There are sometimes when I walk into a classroom and I can see that there are children, uh, youth in our community who look at me as, you know, their eyes get big and, 
uh, oh no, the police are here, you know? And, and my goal is that by the time I'm done teaching that curriculum is that when I walk in the classroom door, there's no longer eyes big because they're worried. There's eyes big because, oh, Deputy Warner's here. We get to talk about, you know, things that help keep us safe and, 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 and that kind of, so it, it, to, we have to change the perception of what law enforcement really is. The second lesson or the third lesson, I always say, how many of you want to talk about all the stuff on my uniform? And everybody raises their hand. Yeah, what's that? What's that? You know, so so we start discussing all these things and all the things that I have. And I always take that opportunity with, with, with the youth of our community to talk about that these are things, these, these are nothing more than tools to help me do my job. And then I say to them, what is my job? And when they say to arrest people, to lock up the bad guys, I correct them. And I say, well, that's part of a law enforcement officer's job, but a law enforcement's job, a law enforcement officer's job, primary goal, primary responsibility is to keep people safe. And so all the things that I have on me are simply things that are supposed to be able to allow me to help keep people safe. That's what we have to start doing. The perception that people have about all the different things that an officer carries should be should be molded at a young age to understand that those are just tools, just like just like the plumber that came in the house to, to, to fix the pipes had a tool belt on and all those two were tools to help them do their job. Just like the electrician climbing up the pole has a tool belt on to help them do their job. And, and we have to change that perception early on so that they don't see those tools that way. It's what one of the, one of the many things I've dedicated my career to is, is, is the, safe and the, the safety of, of the youth of our community. Um, but along with that, changing their perception about law enforcement. And I know that's a very long answer and I apologize, but it's, it's something that I'm, I'm obviously, I think is really important. When it comes to public safety, how do you plan to address the increase in gun violence? Well, the increase in, 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 in gun violence, I, I mean, we have laws in place. A law enforcement officer, which is what I am, has a, has, has a primary duty to enforce the laws. And so we have to enforce those laws. And if we're doing that, then we are doing what, what the public expects of us, you know, but to change people's mindset or, 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 the, or the idea of what, what I mean, I'm a, I'm a second amendment person. I, I, I believe that our forefathers believe that the incredible government that they were creating could someday actually turn against them. And they believe that that should be possible for us to defend ourselves in the case that was to happen. So I believe that, that I believe in that, you know, ever, that all people have the right to, be, to bear arms. But I also believe that if you've committed a crime, you forfeited that right. But being a second amendment person, one of the things that I think is important that we do is that we offer people an opportunity for safety training. Um, I, often, I often believe that when, when Ohio incorporated the CCW law, uh, and people uh, started going out to get their, their concealed carry permit, um, they did a favor to everybody. There are those people who just, you know, really wanted to carry a weapon, but then there are people who went through that training, and they were educated about what they're actually doing, and they were educated about the responsibility that they were taking on. And I have heard many, many times, many times, I have heard people say, you know, I went through that training, and I realized, you know, some of the, the legal liabilities, the responsibilities, and, you know, it was just, it was, and, 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 and I have it, but I, I don't carry. I, I just, I, I decided that I don't want to carry it. Why? Because they were educated on it. And then there are those people who carry it, who took the safety issue to heart and, the, and, the, and, and really understand the importance of that. Um, you know, gun violence, you know, we respond to gun violence on a regular basis. I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious to know how much of the gun violence you know, that's happening in our country is gun violence from those who have not received training or maybe have those weapons illegally. How can we address that? Now, that, that, that's, that's a long, long-standing issue. You know, how do we take those guns away from the people who shouldn't have them, away from the people who are purposely trying to do harm? We have laws in place that say if you break this particular law, you know, you've convicted of this, you're convicted of that, you can no longer have a gun. But how are we identifying whether or not those people that shouldn't have a gun, how do they have them? It's, 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 it's all done through enforcing the laws that we have in place and, and, and doing investigation and following up on things. The jail in downtown Toledo has been an issue because of the effect its age has had on its infrastructure. Are you in favor of building a new jail 
or keeping it downtown? Well, the building itself, I, I, I think that conversation is is over. We, I think everybody understands that that building itself is outdated. Um, it's costing us money just because of, of the age of it, like you, like you said. Um, and it's also probably costing us money in its design. There's a lot, there are a lot more modern and more effective ways to design a facility that could also uh, end up saving us money in the long run. But the location of, of the jail is something that seems to be debated right now. I personally feel that our, our Lucas County Corrections facility is located downtown and all around it are is the location of support services. When somebody walks out of the Lucas County Jail, when they've been released, let's say, um, they're looking for a number of different things. Maybe they have to go straight to probation, which is just a couple blocks away. Maybe they are looking for their attorney. Most attorneys have located themselves downtown. Maybe they're looking for a drug treatment facility. Uh, and a lot of those drug treatment facilities are downtown. Or maybe they don't even have a ride. Well, the Tarta bus station is just a few blocks away. So I believe that we should not take that facility away from the support services. All those support services are there. If we move the jail away from downtown, now we're placing all those support services in an interesting situation where they have to either try to move themselves, relocate closer to the jail, um, or try to figure out how they're going to get people to and from uh, in those circumstances that I just mentioned. So my stance is that should be downtown. And one thing I always point out to people is that the county commissioners have the, the ultimate say on where that's going to go. The sheriff doesn't get the final say. But as sheriff, I tell people that I certainly would be the one trying to convince them to keep it near the support services. If you're elected, how will you be active in the community and build a solid relationship between those who maybe don't have a positive relationship already with the sheriff's department? And, and, and that does exist. And so one of, one of my goals is to create uh, more community engagement. The problem with community engagement is if you, you first have to, you have to first create venues that allow that to happen. And you have to also find um, those employees who are willing to go out and do that engagement. And so I certainly have had a wonderful opportunity in my career to do a lot of community engagement. I want to continue to do that, what I do. Um, sitting on boards and, and, uh, and, and things like that is, is important. I, found, I, I have found it helpful in getting to know a lot of our community members, but you know, are those the community members that we're really supposed to be reaching out to? Probably not, but they are the people who can help create the venues and help us find those people that we do need to do more engagement with. We do need to have more more contact with. And so we can use all those different boards and all those people in our community that do so many wonderful things to help hook us up with, uh, help us find, help us help us communicate and, and interact with those uh, those people just, just as you're as you're as you're mentioning there. Is there anything else you want to add that I didn't already ask you about? If we have five to six hundred employees in the sheriff's office and and uh, I'm a 23 year military veteran. Um, I was active duty Air Force I was Ohio Air National Guard and I was Air Force Reserves. And in those 23 years, I think one of the most important things that I learned was um, the importance of structure. Um, structure is, is something that uh, helps create unity. And I, am, you, I, I also learned the importance of uni uniformity in a large organization. Uh, I think that's very important. But one of the things that was, that was shared with me a lot and I had a lot of training, I had a lot of specialized uh, classes about leadership. And I have a very good understanding of what leadership really is. And when we talk about leadership, there are times that it's necessary to go outside an organization to find leadership uh, that will come in and lead an organization. And sometimes, sometimes there's people within that organization that can be promoted to that leadership role. And I believe that I'm that person within, within the sheriff's office who already understands the job. I've had the good fortune of watching the current sheriff and some of the amazing things that he's done over the years, I already know and understand that job. So there's not going to be a time where I have to learn people's names, you know, and, and who are in main, the main spots and different, you know, I, I already know who's leading which section. I already know all those things. So day one for me is just another day uh, at the same place of employment in another seat. Lucas County Sheriff's candidate, Brett Warner, thank you for your time and for your service. Thank you for the opportunity. I really, really appreciate it.